Good morning. Um, I was asked by Dr. Nissen to talk about ulcer surgery today. I've taken great license with those somewhat open instructions. And uh, I'm going to tell you some things I've learned about ultra, ulcer surgery over the years. Ultra surge, ulcer surgery is becoming more and more obsolete, but it has a glorious uh, history. So um, June 6, 1836, I think Fort Sam Houston or the, uh, the garrison here, Army garrison here in San Antonio was established in 1837. In 1836, a 19 year old fur trader, Alexis St. Martin, sustained a gun, uh, left upper quadrant shotgun wound to the abdomen uh, and was brought to Fort Mackinac, which is up on the US Canadian border or what was to be the US Canadian border to Army Surgeon William Beaumont. Uh, he was the only surgeon within 300 miles. Uh, Beaumont observed a large wound in the left upper quadrant and predicted the patient would die in 36 hours, but he survived and developed persistent gastric fistula. Um, Beaumont, who was just one guy out in the boondocks, made observations that established the role of gastric juices in uh, digestion. To that point, the stomach was thought to be an organ responsible for a nice vocabulary word, trituration. Trituration just means grinding up and pulverizing. And so the, uh, uh, he established that gastric juice was large, largely responsible for the degradation of tissues in the stomach, food in the stomach, and it was acid in nature. Uh, Alexis St. Martin, Shown in this picture here in the bed, you can see he was sort of a long-haired ne'er-do-well. I think the artist omitted multiple tattoos that he likely had. Um, he uh, never really amounted to much. He couldn't earn a living. He had a gastric fistula after all, so it's probably hard to get a job. They weren't Walmart greeters back then. So he, um, he ended up living with William Beaumont just, they had this synergistic relationship. He could be observed for several years. Beaumont actually got him enlisted in the U.S. Army so that he could be transferred with him and have a salary. It's very interesting. Uh, okay, let's see. Advance. So this picture, I'm not sure you'll recognize it. I hope you do. This is a painting of Ether Day. William Morton is at the head of the table. Uh, let's see if I can use this thing. Oop, okay, this is not what I wanna do. Uh, can you see, yeah, there's William Morton. He's a dentist. He's giving the anesthetic. This flask in his hand has sulfuric ether in it. The surgeon, John Collins Warren, right <coughs> there did the first procedure under a general anesthetic without the patient screaming in pain. No one had to hold her down. And he pronounced to a very impressed audience, this gentleman is no humbug. Several demonstrations have been attempted before and the patient usually started screaming in pain and they were humbug, but not this time. Uh, Crawford Long had used the same uh, substance several times. Uh, dating back to 1842 in Georgia, but he never wrote about it. So, uh, and then this is a, the MGH. So they made sure uh, Morton got the credit. Um, that enabled surgeons to enter the abdomen and also enabled them to do animal preparations, if you think about it. This is uh, Louis Pasteur in 1860. He put forth the germ theory of disease, studying fermentation and putrefaction. Here, uh, he is obtaining a saliva sample from a rabid dog with no gloves. His assistant is holding the rabid dog down. Rabies is a non-survivable disease. So this was either brave or foolhardy, but he was able to get a specimen and he did develop a rabies vaccine that was used successfully, uh, an interesting guy. And then uh, Pasteur's theories of uh, 
the germ theory, they were read by Joseph Lister in England, and he devised a surgical antisepsis with carbolic acid. Now, an antiseptic is not an antibiotic or an antimicrobial. It's something that kills germs on surfaces. And he has this device in the foreground is a sprayer. He sprayed carbolic acid over the wound and over the hands of the operators during operation and brought infection rates down to the 10% range. Before then, a simple amputation ended in uh, gangrene and death in roughly 50% of cases. So these advances sort of paved the way for the abdominal operation. Now, this is a timeline that um, I was looking for some sort of uh, software to make this, and I finally just drew it on a piece of graph paper and took a picture of it. But um, so 1830, the HMS Beagle and Charles Darwin sailed about here, Texas Revolution somewhere in here. This is William Beaumont in 1838, and then Wilhelm Rimkin made the first x-rays in this decade, and then this is Morton and Long general anesthesia. In the next decade, right here, 1860, the germ theory of disease, and then Lister and antisepsis about five years later. Now, this is in a day, of course, without the internet, and journals were written in various languages that had to be translated and used moved a little more slowly. Um, and then in America, we had this minor disturbance in the 1860s, the American Civil War. But uh, in, in the late 1870s, the first gastrectomy was recorded, reported in 1879. Um, Reidegger in Chelmno, Poland, reported a gastrectomy. The patient died on the table. Um, Jules Yule Pion, Jules Pion described an attempt in 1880. The patient died 24 hours later. Now remember, these people were operating with ether, an ether soaked sponge giving anesthesia. They had no IV. The patient had no IV. There was no fluid resuscitation. That wasn't a thing, you know, they operated and the patient either did okay or not. Uh, the indications for gastrectomy were usually a palpable tumor in the abdomen. So someone would come in with a palpable tumor in the abdomen and the surgeon would say, well, I could try and take it out. And people were foolish enough to agree to that. Um, and, the, and we're dealing with gastric cancer, gastric cancer, a palpable tumor in the mm -hmm. abdomen. So uh, two months after Peon's failed attempt in 1881, Bill Roth saw Teresa Heller, a 40-year-old woman in his clinic. She had a palpable abdominal mass. He operated on her and removed her distal stomach and pylorus, and he sewed the duodenum to the gastric remnant. Now, the gastric remnant was probably pretty large if she had an obstructing tumor, that's the only thing I can think of because a gastroduodenostomy requires some mobilization. Theodore Coker has not described the Coker maneuver yet. And I mean, intestinal anastomosis was in its infancy, but she survived for three and a half years. The reason we think she had gastric cancer is because three and a half years later when she died, the post-mortem exam showed tumors in her liver. Uh, her stomach is, still on display. This is a picture of the resected specimen on the left. I'm sorry, there's resected specimen on the right, the mass. And then at post, they removed her stomach and you can see Bill Ross anastomosis. Um, you can go see this at the Joseph Denham Museum at the University of Vienna, if you're ever over there in Vienna. This is a famous painting by Seligman, it sits in the uh, Belvedere Museum in Vienna, it's Bill Roth's clinic. Bill Roth is in yellow in the middle. If you thought that everybody in this era was in black and white, and this is evidence to the contrary. And then uh, Austria issued a gold coin memorializing Coker in 2009, a 50 euro gold coin. Ivan Pavlov, shown here with the distinguished white beard, 
and bald head, uh, won the Nobel Prize in 1904. They didn't give Nobel Prizes until 1901, so none of the other people had a chance. Um, Pavlov elucidated the role of the vagus in gastric secretion uh, by experiments on dogs. He would divert the esophagus to the neck and then uh, cannulate the stomach. And by feeding dogs, and of course, all the food would go out their esophagostomy and measuring gastric output, he showed that uh, gastric secretion was influenced when the dog ate. And then he sectioned the vagus nerves below the diaphragm and showed that that uh, gastric secretion was abolished. And this established the role of the vagus nerve in gastric secretion. Pavlov was a neuro physiologist, neuropsychologist. His thing was the nervous system. Uh, hormones were not known before 19, uh, 1901. So when he did all these experiments, he, he was a little bit of a narcissist and he postulated nervism that everything in the, in the human uh, body was controlled by nerves and nerves were it. Um, Pavlov uh, went to the University at St. Petersburg and was taught chemistry by Dmitry Mendeleev, who devised the periodic table of the elements. He married a good friend of Dostoevsky. Um, he was not a nice person. He was not kind to dogs. Uh, gastric, <laughs> dogs, gastric secretions were given as a uh, tonic that was very popular at the time, and selling this was lucrative. So he uh, cannulated through a cervical esophagostomy, the stomachs of like six large dogs at a time, tied them to a bar and put a big bowl of minced meat in front of them and aspirated their gastric secretions and sold thousands of bottles of this to keep this lab going. And the dogs just starved to death ultimately and he got new ones. Uh, he also experimented on orphan children and uh, did experiments on severe stress and pain in humans, which I could not find a description of and I didn't look very hard. Um, he lived during the, he was, uh, his lab was active during the Bolshevik revolution. He almost starved to death uh, during the early years. One third of the scientists in his lab starved to death, uh, but he escaped starvation um, by threatening to leave Russia and uh, the state decided to fund his lab. He also escaped the terror of Stalin narrowly, but survived to the age of 80. So um, in only a few years, Pavlov's universal theory of nervism was disrupted by the birth of endocrinology. Bayless and Starling identified the first hormone secretin and described its regulation of pancreatic function. They did this by just extracting the mucosa of the small intestine and then naming, postulating a substance secretin. Uh, a few years later, Dale won the Nobel Prize for his uh, discovery of um, acetylcholine and its action. Edkins, uh, shown at the top left here, um, theorized the existence of gastrin by taking gastric mucosa, uh, extracting it and injecting it into the internal jugular veins of dogs and then sampling their uh, acid secretion and found that it stimulated acid secretion. But it also stimulated uh, um, acetylcholine. And so all the effects, people sort of poo-pooed his experiment and said, oh, it's just acetylcholine and gastrin sort of died right there. Um, Edkins also uh, wrote about a spiral bacterium in the stomach of cats, but that never went anywhere for about 100 years. Okay, so back to our timeline. So we're right about Here in the early years of the 1900s. Um, incidentally, I thought this was interesting. So this is approximately where Dr. Clifton was born. 
These are the major events of the century. So Dr. Clifton was born here. <laughs> I was born here. And I don't know if anybody knows Dr. Rosenthal. Does anybody know Dr. Rosenthal? He was a mentor of mine. Dr. Rosenthal was born here. And what was really disturbing to me is the distance between Carlos Clifton and me is roughly the distance between <laughs> me and Dr. Rosenthal. But Dr. Rosenthal is an old man. And, and I'm just a couple of years older than Clifton, so I don't understand that. <laughs> My grandfather was born here in 1900, just before the first Nobel Prize was uh, given. So in the 1900s, though, amazing things have happened. Damajek uh, invented Prontosil, working for IG Farben in Germany uh, in the 1930s. He won the Nobel Prize. But he was Jewish, and being a Jewish in Germany in the 1930s was not a good thing. Um, he was not allowed to go to Sweden to collect his prize, but he did collect it after the war. Um, Alexander Fleming observed the penicillin, uh, penicillium inhibited growth of bacteria on a culture plate in 1945. Massa, a resident at the Mayo Clinic, invented the angiocat. In 1950. Before 1950, <clears throat> IV drip of fluid was really not available. 1950. Um, Stanley Dudrick developed a TPN by demonstrating that he could raise puppies without feeding them by mouth at all on infusions. And uh, it was uh, first used in the late 60s. TPN is sort of taken for granted by most people now, but before uh, 1970, basically, if you had a fistula, a GI fistula, you were going to die. You were going to starve to death, unless it could be fixed surgically. So people would charge back in to repair fistulae, and it rarely worked, and a lot of people died. So a fistula was a big, big deal until relatively recently. Now, you may not think this is relatively recently, but like I was alive then. And then, uh, Black discovered the H2 receptor and uh, working for Smith, Klein, French, and cimetidine followed an H2 blocker. And then, you know, ulcer disease just sort of stopped. And then the final nails in the coffin, and that result, and then Barry Marshall and uh, Robin Warren discovered H. pylori and how to treat that. Okay, but let's keep going through the, the surgery part of this. So um, vagotomy was applied by some people for uh, acid reduction and surgery disease, but gastrectomy was mostly used to remove the acid producing part of the organ. And so extended gastrectomies were practiced and that worked pretty well. And most people liked that better than vagotomy. But you know, this is sort of the wild west and everybody's doing all kinds of things. So the development of vagotomy is pretty interesting. Jabelet, uh, described, uh, did the first phagotomy in Lyon, France for Tibetic crisis. So Tibetic crisis is tertiary syphilis, tabes dorsalis. People would get horrific abdominal pains that would strike like lightning, would disable them. It was agonizing. There was really no treatment for it. The pains could last a few minutes, a few days, a few weeks, or a few months and a lot of people killed themselves. Uh, he postulated that vagotomy would help this, and he did a few of them, and sometimes it helped and sometimes it didn't. Um, Latter J, uh, and you may be familiar with his eponymous nerves of Latter J, uh, advocated selective vagotomy. He would follow the vagi down onto the stomach and section them distal to the hepatic branch and the celiac branches. So he would just innervate the stomach. He thought there was value in leaving the hepatic and celiac innervation. If there is value, nobody has really been able to describe what it is. Uh, Lester Dregstedt in the 1940s and 50s revived vagotomy in his studies uh, using a Heidenhain pouch, which I'll get into in a minute and uh, also combined it with uh, antrectomy and 
in the 1970s, this was the ulcer operation choice in America. Europeans still did vagotomy and drainage procedures. And then Griffith described uh, the highly selective vagotomy in Seattle in the late 1970s, but it was too late. Ulcer disease had medical treatment by then. Uh, this was a difficult operation to learn and pull off. You needed a lot of experience and there wasn't a lot of ulcer disease. It also isn't well applied to emergency ulcer surgery. So highly selective vagotomy is still talked about, but it's, it's really not a thing anymore. So here uh, at, the, at the top is the normal vagal anatomy. Now, the thing about these pictures is that the vagal anatomy is variable. It's like venous anatomy. It's, it's not all the same. So there's often a branch, for instance, of the posterior vagus that comes off and uh, I'll try and use my pointer here. Okay, so the posterior vagus here, this most proximal branch innervates the auxinic cells in the fundus. Sometimes it'll come off way up on the esophagus and track this way over to the fundus. So if you're doing a truncal vagotomy, you think you've sectioned all the vagal innervation, but there's a nerve way up here coming across. This nerve is... Uh, worrisome enough that it's been named the criminal nerve of Grassi because it's responsible for, believed to be responsible for ulcer recurrence when you miss it. So suffice it to say, even a truncal vagotomy is not that easy to pull off and completely denervate the auxinic cells or the parietal cell mass. Uh, and so there is a recurrence rate after vagotomy. This is, uh, let's see, this is Latterger's selective vagotomy below the first branches to the celiac and the uh, liver. And then uh, this is the highly selective vagotomy where these nerves here below the, uh, the other branches, these are the nerves of Latterge. These nerves are preserved and the branches out to the parietal cell mass are individually in identified and ligated. They're very hard to see because they're white it's easier to see the little blood vessels that run with them. So most of the time you just take those little blood vessels and uh, you leave the terminal branches for about seven centimeters uh, on the, on the antrum of the stomach. That way the antral pump is left intact and relaxation of the pylorus is left intact. When it is done well, there are some series where this is highly effective, but again, it has to be learned. One thing that was learned is that when you ligate all those little branches that run with the nerves, sometimes you get necrosis of the lesser curve of the stomach. That was probably an unpleasant surprise when it first happened. So now most people re recommend imbricating the lesser curve of the stomach when you do that operation. Obviously that's not a good operation if the pylorus is diseased by scarring or some sort of instrumentation like cutting it open to oversew a bleeding ulcer. So this is more for intractable ulcer disease, which frankly doesn't really exist anymore. Um, when you vagotomize the stomach, you really injure gastric emptying, cause gastric stasis by several mechanisms. So vagal innervation causes receptive relaxation of the fundus. So the more you eat, the more you put into your stomach, the fundus expands and accommodates it so you have lower pressure in the stomach. Uh, and then the vagi are also, they innervate the antral pump and relaxation of the pylorus. When you reduce the ability of the stomach to expand, take away the antral pump and the pylorus, you get early satiety and gastric stasis, and that's a problem. It's not a problem every time, uh, but in about 30% of patients, it is a problem. So a drainage procedure is generally combined with vagotomy. And the popular drainage procedures are the Heineke Michalix. So Heineke and Michalix were two separate people, and they came up with this uh, procedure at the same time, essentially. Um, Heineke at the University of Erlangen, uh, in Prussia, and Michalix, who is a pupil of Bill Roth. Uh, he also trained Ferdinand Sauerbruch, who trained Rudolf Nissen, and that's an interesting story that we will not tell, even though it's tempting. 
Um, Diabolé described a uh, gastroduodenostomy. Oh, thank you. I could hurt somebody with this. It's a green one. Um, Diabolé in 1892 in Lyon, his pupils were Lariche, René Lariche and Alexis Carell, whose names you may recognize. I hope Dr. Sheckman does. And then uh, John M.T. Finney at Hopkins in 1902 uh, described the Finney pyloroplasty, which the Finney pyloroplasty looks very much like Jabalais. It's just connected right here, and it's a distal duodeno gastrostomy, essentially. And then, of course, the gastrojejunostomy, which avoids the uh, ulcer and fibrous duodenum altogether. So um, these are the operations that uh, were being practiced. A gastrectomy, partial, total, near total, or antrectomy. Uh, this was effective, but there was a recurrence rate, especially for duodenal ulcers. Vagotomy, truncal, selective, highly selective, drainage procedures, lots of varieties, and closure perforations, simple closure perforations described at the, in, the, uh, in the very early 1900s by um, Roscoe Graham of Toronto. And then under-sew and over-sew and various U-stitches and figure of eight stitches described bleeding. When you have a lot of procedures for the same thing, it's safe to say that probably none of them works all that well. Now, it was noted that gastric ulcers behave different, differently, mostly. So, Johnson came up with a scheme of typing gastric ulcers. There was the type one gastric ulcer on the lesser curve, usually within a couple centimeters of the margin of the uh, antrum and the uh, body of the stomach. Um, there was the, this was originally a type three ulcer up near the cardia, and then ulcers associated with uh, uh, prepyloric were um, type two, but this was changed a few late years later and they decided to have five. Um, now we have five types of gastric ulcers. So type one is the same. Type two and type three are significant because they're associated with acid hypersecretion, whereas type one and type five, and of course, insate induced ulcer, ulcers, not necessarily. So the recommendation uh, was for type one and type five ulcers, a simple resection of the ulcer was sufficient. You didn't need to do a vagotomy. To do a vagotomy was meddlesome, invited all the consequences of vagotomy that were unwanted, and you did need to do it. We resect gastric ulcers for several reasons. One is that between five and 15% are gonna be malignant. A duodenal ulcer is virtually never malignant. Don't resect a duodenal ulcer, that's a bad idea. The duodenal, duodenum is retroperitoneum, if you resect the ulcer, you're going to narrow the duodenum. And then there are other things that are very close by, like the pancreas, the duct of Santorini. Um, don't resect duodenal ulcers. But the stomach is big and wide, so you can resect ulcers in the stomach. And it's a good idea to do because ulcers in the stomach are not infrequently carcinoma. So you have to diagnose that. Um, Ulcers that are in the stomach that are associated with a duodenal ulcer, though, are usually acid dependent. And same thing with prepyloric ulcers. And that's sometimes described as an ulcer within two centimeters of the pylorus. It's a good idea to do a vagotomy and resection. These can generally be resected with antrectomy, antrectomy here. But this is a problem. When the ulcer is up by the cardia, it's close to the esophagus. So mere mortals are terrified of the esophagus. And we don't like to operate on the esophagus. Esophageal anastomoses are dicey, and it's easy to narrow the esophagus. So there have been ways described to resect gastric ulcers. So ulcer excision, simple excision here, or antrectomy. If the ulcer is up on the lesser curvature, Poche described a procedure where do an antrectomy and have a tongue of tissue up to include the, uh, the ulcer, but it's long been observed that simple resection of the antrum will heal high gastric ulcers if they're not malignant. 
So you can just do an antrectomy and the, the upper gastric ulcer, the more proximal gastric ulcer will heal if it's not malignant. So one option, if you get in this situation, is to just biopsy the heck out of this ulcer and do a distal gastrectomy. Another option is to take out most of the stomach and a little tongue up here toward the ulcer and then reconstruct with a rue limb and have your gastro jejunostomy cover this defect up here close to the esophagus so you don't have to close it and narrow it. That's a Sindes procedure. Well, if you resect the antrum, you're gonna have a duodenal stump. And the duodenal stump has long been recognized as an Achilles heel of gastric surgery, especially back in the day when people had ulcer disease and came to operation, it was frequently very bad ulcer disease, chronic. And so the duodenum was scarred and fibrotic and peeling the duodenum off the pancreas was dicey. And then you were left with a devascularized duodenum very often because the stomach has a great blood supply. The duodenum, not as great. It's not bad, but it's not like the stomach. And so this duodenum has been beat up. And at some point you're gonna dissect duodenum close enough to where the duct of Santorini enters, the accessory pancreatic duct, which enters the duodenum proximal to the major pancreatic duct. In some people, not everyone, but it's very unusual to be able to see it or feel it. So most people do not like to resect more than two centimeters of duodenum or else you're, you're nervous. So closing the stump can be dicey if you can't mobilize enough of the posterior duodenum wall to do a suture closure. One of the ways out was described by um, Rudolf Nissen, where the ulcer, the duodenum has been resected. This is the fibrous bed of an ulcer crater in the pancreas. Now, this only works with chronic ulcer disease when there's a fibrous bed in the pancreas. If there's no fibrous bed, there's nothing to sew to. But you can take a knife and cut the duodenum off flush with the distal edge of the ulcer crater and then you sew this anterior edge of duodenum straight down and you get very small, very careful, very precise while you're praying, bites of the fibrotic ulcer crater and fibrotic pancreas and duodenum. And what you're praying about is that your sutures don't go too deep and grab the common duct or the duct of Santorini because then you're gonna get a rip-roaring pancreatitis and that's gonna be bad news for this duodenal stump. So you have a single layer closure that's shown here. Here's the ulcer crater that's fibrotic. These little dots here, I'm thinking maybe they're figure of eight sutures in a bleeding crater or something like that. So now you reach back and you grab the serosa. Here's the, the first suture line. You grab the serosa and after cocorizing the duodenum very thoroughly, so you've mobilized it, you bring the serosa down and you sew it to the proximal edge of the crater like this. So that's a, a Nissen closure. This actually works very well when you have this situation, but it doesn't work in other situations. If you observe pancreatic juice leaking out of a hole right here, then I would not do this. In that case, I would try to just sew this edge down to the crater and internalize that. Or maybe bring up a rue limb and do a duodeno jejunostomy. This is all really, you know, making up stuff and hoping it works. This is a bad situation. So that's one difficult duodenal stump. Another difficult duodenal stump is if you recognize it, maybe you don't have bleeding, maybe you have obstruction. So there's nothing making you cut into this badness here. This is bad. When you see this danger, danger, don't go here. So you can amputate the stomach here and then resect the mucosa of the stomach back to the pylorus. If you leave antrum here, that's going to be a gastroinfactory and cause recurrent ulceration. So you want to resect the antral mucosa, trim up the muscular wall, and then you just See, this is a, the closure of the lumen internally at the pylorus, and then you close the muscular wall here. If you're gonna do this, this is a Bancroft closure, it's nice to decide you're gonna do it before you take 
the right gastric and before you take the right gastroepiploic because that's what this depends on. I've never done this. I've done this enclosures and this enclosures work well because I've done two or three of them and the patient lived. I've never done this. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. And it probably bleeds a lot. And then you're trying to see down the hole into the, where the, you know, where the pylorus is, which who knows where the pylorus is in a real scarred pyloric channel, so. Okay, post bigotomy and gastrectomy syndromes. These operations, they work and they address ulcer disease, but they create other problems. One of them is diarrhea. So post bigotomy, diarrhea is a thing and it can be a very bad thing and there really is no good treatment for it. You can't go back and put the vagi back together. Dumping, you all know about early and late dumping and dumping can be a mere nuisance or it can be debilitating. Dumping that's a mere nuisance is the dumping that your patient has. Debilitating dumping is the dumping that you have for your ulcer operation. So it's just to say surgeons tend to dismiss collateral damage from operations. It's like, well, you're alive, aren't you? Can't you just be happy with that? Um, gastric stasis. Gastric stasis is a big problem. Even pyloroplasty, sometimes the stomach doesn't drain well because of denervation of the uh, antral pump and the problems with uh, capacitance of the stomach. Gastroenterostomies are notorious for not emptying. That doesn't mean they never empty, but there's a high rate of gastric stasis when you mess around with the distal stomach. Afferent loop syndrome. So the loop from the duodenal stump to the gastrojejunostomy is afferent loop. That can kink, that can stricture. And when it does, if there's any degree of obstruction, the stump can blow out. If the stump heals, then you can have a dilated afferent loop that will dilate into stem and cause bad crampy pain. Bacteria will overgrow, bile will collect in that stump. And then all of a sudden it gushes and empties into the stomach and the patient vomits this foul bacteria laden bile. And this, this can be very nasty. Uh, Efferent loop syndromes are usually related to marginal ulcers at the anastomosis, uh, at the gastrojejunostomy, and are obstructive in nature and cause accumulation of the bilious fluid from the afferent loop in the stomach, bad esophagitis, bad gastritis, and uh, proton pump inhibitors and tagamet does nothing for. Stricture is uh, not uncommon in efferent loop. Um, bile gastritis, esophagitis, I've mentioned that. Malnutrition, nutritional con consequences from losing your antrum uh, and gastric acid have to be attended to. And then recurrent or marginal ulceration off the page. So I found this in a textbook. I think these results are wildly optimistic, but these are the basic operations. And this is what I learned in my residency, that um, truncal vagotomy and antrectomy, the most commonly practiced operation in the US uh, when I was training, had a higher operative mortality um, of about 1% in elective operations. So 1% mortality in elective operation, I mean, that's what cardiothoracic surgeons do. We don't do that kind of stuff to people, unless you're a surgical oncologist, I guess you do that. But um, ulcer recurrence rates for vagotomy and antrectomy are less than 2%. Most people say less than 1%. So it's a very good operation for ulcer disease, but here you have mild dumping 10 to 15% of the time, severe dumping, up to 2% of the time, this is probably higher. And then di diarrhea, 20% of the time, mild, one to 2% untreatable, intractable diarrhea, making a person miserable, 2% of the time. Truncal vagotomy and pyloroplasty, this is what European surgeons do. I did this when I was uh, at Bentab in 1990, 
And George Jordan, a very famous professor, mocked me publicly and questioned my manliness in front of everybody. But it's favored because the mortality is much lower. It's safer to do. And most textbooks say, if you have a patient in shock, like for bleeding, don't do a gastrectomy. It's too high risk. And that's exactly what I did. But he said, You're, well, if you can't do the operation, you shouldn't be operating in the first place. So anyways, um, the ulcer recurrence rate, this is his problem with it. Five to really, there are studies that show a 20% ulcer recurrence rate with just phagotomy and pyloroplasty. And it's thought to be due to inadequate phagotomy. Um, dumping syndrome, uh, a little better, but diarrhea, higher. Why would diarrhea be higher? Maybe more people live to have diarrhea, I don't know. And then parietal cell vagotomy, this when done well in the right hands, there are reports of amazing results. So a 0% mortality rate, but still this persistent ulcer recurrence rate, but here the post vagotomy and gastrectomy syndromes are virtually eliminated. Okay, so here we are. Uh, in the 80s, when highly selective vagotomy was being described, omeprazole was being developed by Hassel working for Astra in Sweden, now AstraZeneca. Um, really, in 1979, he formulated it. It wasn't approved by the FDA here until 1989. And then Marshall and Warren found H. pylori. They wrote about it. They described very convincing results, but nobody believed them until Barry Marshall infected himself with H. pylori, and he finally got people's attention and convinced people. They're Australians, by the way. Barry Marshall, Robin Warren, and this is their poster at the uh, Nobel ceremony showing the process of H. pylori infection and mucosal damage, et cetera. Okay, so where does that leave us at this point? Um, oh, it's 7.44, not bad. So now really nobody does ulcer surgery for intractable ulcers. We have omeprazole and we have treatment of H. pylori. So the only time ulcers are intractable is when you have a patient who won't take his medicine, which does happen, but that might not be the patient that you wanna give intractable diarrhea to. Either you can find somebody to do a highly selective vagotomy or you wanna read about it and give it a try. Maybe you could do that, but you're, you're not gonna do that. You'll do, go your whole careers, I think, and not do a highly selective vagotomy. Um, vagotomy is being done by the bariatric crowd because it has an effect on ghrelin and appetite and all that, but uh, I don't know anything about it. So surgical indications for peptic uh, ulcer disease now are perforation, bleeding, and obstruction, or the complications of the disease, usually emergency complications. So the goals of operation are seal the perforation and some peritoneal toilet. That just means irrigating the abdomen. Stop the bleeding. Sample a gastric ulcer for histology, and maybe H. pylori as well. And then way down the list is reduce the incidence of recurrence. But really, when you're in the operating room with somebody like this, all you want to do is stop the bleeding, seal the perforation, get them out of the hospital alive. If the ulcer recurs, the gastroenterologist can worry about that with some omeprazole and extirpation of H. pylori. The aphorism that I was taught this was when we were talking about doing a vagotomy and antrectomy versus vagotomy and pyloroplasty, was a drowning man needs a life preserver, not a swimming lesson. So when you take someone to the operating room for an emergency, just deal with the problem at hand, unless it's absolutely necessary to do otherwise. So for perforation, patch the hole. Ulcers don't close well because when you're looking at the ulcer from the outside, you might say, oh, I can just put a stitch in this. But on the inside is a big ulcer around the perforation. It's not good tissue. The sutures can pull through and make a bigger mess. So uh, only for gastric ulcers, not duodenal ulcers, 
resect them and biopsy the ulcer. You don't really need to biopsy a duodenal ulcer, especially if it's bleeding. Why would you do that? But if you want to, you can for uh, H. pylori, et cetera, but you're not really worried about cancer. There is a paper that is a review of um, NISQIP data, which shows better results, lower ulcer recurrence that's measurable for phagotomy and drainage with perforation in a stable patient in a perfect situation. But when surgeons who are actually out there operating are surveyed, no one does it. No one does it. The operation is dying. In fact, there was a paper in the British, British Medical Journal in 1991 entitled Requiem for the Vagotomy. Okay, bleeding ulcers. Bleeding ulcers are the most common complication of ulcers, but we don't deal with them that much because the gastroenterologists have very good techniques. Even if the first time they fail and you have a re-bleed, you can let them try a second time because they'll usually be successful in the second time. But if you have to operate for bleeding ulcer, one of the things you have to remember is it is almost essential to know where the bleeding is from before you operate. So get GI to scope the patient or you scope the patient if you can do that. It's kind of hard when the stomach's full of blood and you need to be have some techniques available to you. But to identify the site of bleeding is really a good idea. You don't want to operate for upper GI bleeding, thinking as duodenal ulcer and find varices or something like that. And then uh, a longitudinal incision across the pylorus. Usually the bleeding ulcer is right there in the bulb. You can oversew the bleeding vessels, a bleeding vessel. There's all sorts of talks about magic use stitches, et cetera. The problem is if it's an ulcer that's eroded into the gastroduodenal artery, there's sometimes the transverse pancreatic branch coming off posteriorly. So people talk about putting a vessel deep behind the, the posterior branch as a U-stitch and tying that off and then a figure of eight above and below. But what most people do is they put in figure of eight sutures until the bleeding stops because all this anatomy is not nearly so clear in the patient as it is in the atlas and in your head. Um, gastric ulcers should be resected again. Biopsy, if it's not possible to resect. Consider vagotomy if no, never mind, no one does it. There's talk about, you know, if they've already been treated for H. pylori and this is recurrent bleeding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But again, you just want to get the guy out of the operating room. I say guy because it's usually a guy, but women get bleeding ulcers too. Okay, obstruction from ulcer disease. Now, this is the worst situation usually, the most difficult situation, but fortunately it's not an emergency. So you don't have to do this in the middle of the night. And at this stage in history, when ulcer disease is usually treated, you should suspect cancer strongly of the stomach, even of the duodenum, it does happen. I've seen it once. Of the pancreas, not pancreas, and of the bile ducts. So proceed with caution. You may end up with a bigger resection than you initially anticipate, but you should be able to work that out with imaging and biopsies. Uh, if it is ulcer disease, the duodenal stump is going to be difficult to impossible. There's another aphorism in surgery that easy surgery is hard surgery. Hard surgery is impossible surgery. So most people in this case would avoid the duodenum altogether and do some sort of bypass, a gastrojejunostomy with a vagotomy. Now here, a vagotomy is important because a gastrojejunostomy without a vagotomy was tried in the early days when duodenal ulcer disease was thought to be due to stasis, people do a gastrojejunostomy, and it was found to be a good ulcer preparation. And in fact, the ulcer preparation to experiment on ulcer treatments in dogs is essentially a gastrojejunostomy without a vagotomy. So if you do a gastrojejunostomy in this point, in this situation, you need to do a vagotomy. Uh, endoscopic dilation sometimes works, but with ulcer disease, it doesn't work for a long time. But heck, I'd let them do it twice. Okay, that's all I've got.
Are there any questions?